Hello and welcome to episode 53 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I'm your host, Paul Markey. And today what we're going to be doing is making you a little more familiar with the role of neurosurgeons in the treatment of lumbar spine pain and radiculopathy. And to do that, I have special guest, Dr. John Wallig uh, from Maine Spine Surgery, who is going to help us with that. But before we get started, I'd like to um, just take a, a few moments and uh, get a word from our sponsor. Hello and welcome back. I'd like to welcome Dr. Wallach to our show. Thanks for uh, joining us. Paul, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, I think this is going to be great. Uh, you, you and I have known each other for, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. Uh, I, can. Sure. Yeah, you know, I, I always remember this one particular lady that we first started with. It was a cervical spine case, a very complicated C5 issue that we both worked together on. And um, at that moment, when I when I made a phone call to you, I always remember how, how easy it was to talk to you and how expeditious you were in getting her down to your office and taking care of the problem. And to this day, I just saw her the other day. To this day, she is super, super happy with how she feels and the, the treatment she, that she had. And ever since then, I think we've had this really great collaborative thing going on that has really helped with uh, patient care. Absolutely. It's been great. And you guys have been fantastic, you know, getting these people tuned up and worked up and, and uh, oftentimes labeled with a diagnosis before uh, before they're even sent down. So really appreciate it. It's a, it's a great collaborative uh, effort here. Great, great. So Dr. Wallach, to get started, I was wondering if you could give us a little rundown on, um, you know, what brought you into the field of neurosurgery? Uh, talk a little bit about your schooling and, um, you know, how did you get from point A to point B? And uh, tell us a little bit about what you're specializing in now. Well, I'm, I'm originally not from Maine. I, uh, I'm uh, from Western New York. And uh, after I was, I was at Yale way back in the day, and uh, I did a lot of molecular biophysics, biochemistry type research there. But always had the idea maybe I should go to med school, and I did. I, I, I went to Columbia in New York City for uh, a stint down there and met some great guys. I, the, the reason I went into neurosurgery was because we rotated on the neurosurgery service, and these guys were just so nice and so welcoming. And, uh, and the pathology, of course, was, was very interesting indeed. So when I finished up at Columbia, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, which is an enormous medical center now. Uh, a, a high volume neurosurgery program, and it became clear again. It's it's mainly the personalities, you know, the the uh, guys and gals that were involved there that that kind of steered me towards spine. And uh, for some reason, I just you know, spine just clicked with me. Uh, I, I was a general neurosurgeon after I finished up for for several years, but but, but really enjoyed spine. And uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Thibodeau and myself, we, we broke away from general neurosurgery at about, about six years ago. And now all we do is spine and we're having a great time. I really enjoy it. Patients are doing well, lots of fun. So spine is, is definitely, uh, it sounds trite, but it's, it's definitely our passion down here. Really enjoy it. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, in order to keep this podcast a little bit on the shorter side, because we could talk about this all day long. I mean, you and I have great conversations almost on a daily, if not weekly basis about about difficult cases and uh, and who needs to have surgery, who doesn't, and how do we manage these folks. Um, but in, in trying to keep this uh, down, I'm going to try to really focus our questions today and uh, we'll go from there. When you evaluate a patient and uh, we try to you know figure out who is uh, surgically urgent or not, and uh, and who needs to be in the neurosurgical office? When you're doing a clinical exam on them, like a neurologic exam, and you're testing the reflexes, sensation, strength, uh, maybe doing a straight leg raise and doing a couple other special tests, what part of that clinical exam really jumps out at you and says, you know what, this person really needs to see a neurosurgeon? You know, I, I know there, there's you, you can put all these together to try to isolate a level, but is there a particular part of those tests that, that you say, you know what, we need to get things moving here? Paul, you know, it's, it's, there's really two things that, that you look for. And if we're talking about lumbar spine and focusing on that, uh, one entity, of course, is, is uh, cauda equina syndrome. And cauda equina syndrome, it's not necessarily an exam finding, but it's a constellation of of symptoms that, that suggest that the nerves that go to the to the bladder uh, as well as to the lower extremities uh, are compromised. And when a patient is losing sensation in the perianal area and has uh, retention, uh, bladder retention, sometimes they don't even know that their their bladder is full. Sometimes they will spontaneously void; they'll be incontinent. That is an emergency. That that definitely gets a gets a phone call. 
uh, and we got to get those people in imaged and treated quickly. The other thing is just any motor deficit that is progressive and concerning, you know, hip flexor weakness, uh, a drop foot, all those are, they're not necessarily emergencies. They, they do move to the front of the line. Reflex asymmetries um, in and of themselves, uh, isolated sensory deficits, even pain, uh, that is not necessarily an emergency. Sometimes the patients will, will feel that way and the pain can be severe, but it's a motor deficit or any bladder dysfunction that really prompts uh, uh, or expedited intervention. Right, right. Now, oftentimes uh, patients will get a phone call from, you know, uh, maybe a mid-level provider or a nurse who is getting a uh, an MRI result or X-ray result, and they, you know, it sounds horrendous. It sounds like, oh my gosh, this person's got a herniated. You've got a herniated disc. You've got severe degenerative lumbar disease, and all this other stuff. Um, you know, do all patients who have a herniated disc require surgery? Why or why not? No, not not not, not at all. In fact. Herniated discs and disc pathology, it's ubiquitous. And, uh, you know, if you get into your 60s, 70s, and 80s, almost 100% of people will have some disc abnormality. And these reports sound so frightening. I, I understand that the radiologists have to, you know, label everything and, and describe every disc space, but the patient gets that report and, oh my goodness, I've got a disc herniation, I've got an annular tear, I've got a disc bulge, I've got lateral recess stenosis. I mean, what is that? But, but um, the description, although it can be terrifying, uh, one, one needs to realize that most disc abnormalities or spinal abnormalities are just part of the wonderful process of aging and they're normal findings on an MRI scan. So uh, it's the symptoms that really drive uh, the need for intervention and not the, not the verbiage on the MRI report. Right, right. So um, would you would you say that if a person does have a herniated disc, that the that annulus pulposus, can that be reabsorbed by the body? I mean, can it be there today and in uh, five months from now, uh, it's not showing up on an MRI? Yeah. In fact, we call that the natural history of the disease. In other words, what happens if we don't do anything? And the vast majority of disc herniations will pull back. They'll shrivel up. They'll dehydrate. They won't pop back into place, but... Uh, uh, the, the, the disc material itself, it's, it's a kind of a cartilaginous material. And once that bulges away or herniates away from the end plates from which that material gets its nutrition, if you will, its, its perfusion, its vascular supply, they're on their own. And these discs shrivel up, get smaller, and fade away. So an MRI scan done six months later sometimes shows that it is resorbed completely. Yes, right. that's, the, that's the, the rule, not the exception. Right, right. Um, all right. So a lot of people, uh, you know, they injure their backs, they all get x-rays. It's kind of like a standard. Now I think insurances force people to have x-rays before they have MRIs and before they can do anything else. And uh, probably even before they can eat dinner, uh, they've got to have uh, an x-ray. Oftentimes these people have x-rays uh, done kind of uh, in an area like ours, rural Maine, and uh, they go down to your office, they drive about six hours, they get down there, and you guys take a whole different set of x-rays. Can you talk a little bit about why certain x-rays are more important than others when evaluating a spine, especially lumbar spine? X-rays are, you know, just, just a front and side view, which is the standard package. They're not incredibly sensitive. Um, I, they'll show obvious abnormalities. They'll show cancer or, or bad infection or fracture or obvious instability. We, we tune them up a little bit. We get what are called dynamic films and they're, they're probably the most helpful film that we get. What we do is we have the patient lay down, that's a supine film, and take a look at the vertebral alignment and then we'll stand them up, challenge them a little bit, stress that spine and even flex them forward and take a picture and extend them backwards and take a picture and see how those building blocks move. And if there is abnormal motion, we call that instability. And that can be a sign that things are just not hanging together and potentially stabilization maybe in that patient's future. Unfortunately, on a X-ray, you cannot see soft tissue. You can't see a disc herniation. You can't see the spinal cord. You can't see the spinal nerves, the spinal fluid. All you see are the calcified building blocks, the vertebral body. So the, the information is relatively limited. But in answer to your question, we tweak them with some dynamic views. Okay. Great. Now, um, oftentimes patients will receive uh, an MRI and it may be ordered by a mid-level provider, family physician. Uh, and let's say this patient has had a previous history of back surgery. 
should the provider order a different type of MRI uh, than the first one, or should they just order the same standard MRI if they have had a previous history, but a re-exacerbation of uh, radiculopathy and, uh, and you know, low back pain? Well, if a patient has had previous surgery, almost always, uh, particularly if the surgery is done in the in, in the recent past, I don't know the exact number, but we'll say the, the last three to five years, almost always the radiologist will want that protocol in such a way that the patient gets contrast. Uh, it's a gadolinium. It's an additive that helps to distinguish scar tissue, which is normal after surgery, and recurrent disc herniation or other pathologies. So if the MRI is ordered in the context of a patient who has had recent surgery, it needs to be ordered with and without contrast. Now, if it's just an exacerbation of a disc herniation that they had three years ago, but they never had surgical intervention, a non-contrast MRI is just fine. Most of the time, the radiologist will stop and say, wait a minute, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to tweak this. We've got to change this. We've got to get that, the uh, gadolinium on board. Sure, but sure. With and without contrast, if patients have had prior surgery. Okay, great. Now, are, are there any contraindications or precautions to use in contrast uh, with uh, these folks? Yeah, there's some, uh, some people will have allergies, uh, intolerances to gadolinium. Uh, they do check, oftentimes as we age, they check the BUN and creatinine kidney function, and they make sure that the kidneys can handle it because my understanding is that gadolinium is uh, processed, uh, eventually excreted uh, by the kidneys. And if the kidneys aren't in good shape, they won't give it. So if there's allergy, a prior reaction, or if the kidneys are subpar, they will hold that. Okay. All right. Well, what I'd like to do is just take a moment and uh, have a word from our sponsor, and we will be back in just a bit. Thank you, everyone, for holding on with us. And um, again, thank you, Dr. Wallach, for being with us. Uh, my next question for you is, and, and probably it's more of a statement first and then a question later, people are absolutely terrified about undergoing lumbar spine surgery. I have low back pain. I want to avoid surgery. I, I, I don't want to go to surgery. And that's kind of, that you know, for me as a therapist, that's great because we want to treat a lot of these folks conservatively. But oftentimes it's inevitable. We, we try conservative treatment. We try interventional pain management. They get injections. They try a, maybe a steroid or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And they are just not responding. We see some, some motor weakness issues. Um, what could we tell people out there about how surgery is different now than it was 15 to 20 years ago, because I certainly see a difference as far as how people respond to surgery, uh, how quickly they uh, they uh, get back to walking and function and, and back to work and, and higher level activity. Um, can you tell us why it's different now than it was 15 to 20 years ago? Well, the reason it's better, there are probably three, three main reasons. One, our imaging is so much better. I mean, back in the day, you're really limited to CT scans. And, and now we have these MRI scans, which are amazing. They show you almost everything and with very, very good resolution. So our imaging is better. So it's not a, a hunt and peck type uh, exploratory surgery. We know exactly where we need to be. And because of that, we can make our incisions quite small and really focus on the pathology. We talk about minimally invasive surgery, where instead of making a great big long incision and doing a lot of muscle dissection, because the imaging is so good, we can whittle the surgery down uh, to, uh, to, to a much smaller avenue to address that pathology. So the imaging is better. Our understanding of spinal mechanics is also much better. Uh, uh, as far as you know, what constitutes instability, uh, who needs to be stabilized? What are the consequences of surgery? Uh, if we do remove uh, aspects of a joint, uh, will the patient eventually become unstable? So our, our understanding of biomechanics has really helped. And finally, our instrumentation. The instrumentation has come a long way. Back in the day, people uh, who underwent fusion, for example, would be wearing body casts and you know, god awful things for for months at a time. But now we have instrumentation that we can put directly into the bone to hold it together, and the relatively small screws and, and short rods that can that can hold things together while the body heals. So, imaging, understanding of biomechanics, and some very cool advances in instrumentation. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, it's not uncommon for a patient to go to 
see their PCP maybe after they've had lumbar spine surgery. So maybe they have some sort of a, a follow up, a physical, and they're having a little discomfort and they, they just can't get back to their neurosurgeon. They can't go see you folks and, and, and get that management. They happen to be in the office with them. Maybe they have a, a torn rotator cuff or a bad knee. And, uh, that primary care physician or provider wants to offer them something as far as medication goes. Is there anything that we, they should be avoiding, especially after lumbar spine surgery within certain time frames, um, especially for like people who have fusions and that type of thing? Well, a fusion is a little bit of a different animal, um, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But, but standard issue decompression surgeries, our number one seller, a microdiscectomy or a lumbar laminectomy, there really are no medications that need to be avoided. We typically start with over-the-counter medications, things like Tylenol and ibuprofen. As you know, in, in this state and even nationally, opiates are, are, are very much discouraged. Uh, a short course of opiates is sometimes appropriate. Uh, but the, the most minimal dose and, and for the shortest duration. Uh, muscle relaxants are sometimes used as well, but the side effect profile and the habit forming nature of those medications also uh, makes those not, not great candidates for, for, for the long term. And there's also anti-convulsant or anti-epileptic medicines that have been kind of pirated for back and leg pain. Things like Neurontin or Gabapentin can help cool down a nerve. But what I think you're getting at with the question about fusion is well fusion is is when we want two bones to grow together if uh, people are unstable between l4 and l5 and we do an l4 5 fusion we want those bones to grow together so medications like steroids and anti-inflammatories short circuit the inflammatory process that we really want to encourage this bone healing so although different practitioners different surgeons have different thoughts on this we typically try to keep people off anti-inflammatories for about two months after a fusion. Okay, great. That's excellent. Uh, good information to know for sure. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts about smoking? People who smoke. Now you're you're ready to do surgery. This person comes in. They've got significant motor weakness, uh, severe radiculopathy. They're obviously having a lot of discomfort. Um, Maybe you have to do emergency surgery, doesn't matter what the situation is, but if somebody can hold off, do you have any thoughts? Have they done any research regarding um, smoking, the uh, the results that you have as a neurosurgeon after doing surgery on somebody who was a smoker? And um, does it delay the healing? I mean, in theory, I would think that it would delay the healing, um, but uh, your thoughts on that? Well, smoking is, is uh, still very prevalent, and uh, I was at a lecture the other day, and nicotine is is one of the most addictive substances on the planet. So I, I feel bad for these folks that are hooked into it. And, and, uh, and fortunately, I, I never started. But, uh, uh, you know, getting off cigarettes is not easy. But the literature, the studies clearly show that for any surgery, spine surgery included, smokers will have a, uh, a worse outcome. They won't do as well. And the, the reasons for that are multifactorial. But specifically for spine surgery, particularly with fusions, we know that fusion is uh, delayed, it is retarded by nicotine on board. And the reason is because the nicotine impairs microvessel ingrowth. And we want this, this microvasculature to bring oxygen and nutrients to the, uh, the developing fusion bed. And when you are consuming nicotine in any form, uh, whether you're vaping or smoking or a nicotine patch, a nicotine gum, it's going to slow down your fusion. So we, we want these folks off nicotine in all its forms. The insurance companies are buying into it now. And sometimes they will demand that the patient have a urine test or other testing to confirm that, yes, indeed, they're off nicotine because they know the numbers. And making that huge investment in a lumbar fusion surgery and then having it all go to pot because nicotine is on board, we, nobody wants that. It's a disaster. So smoking, bad. Uh, many, many different reasons for that. But with fusion, uh, it, it really uh, di disrupts that, that, that process, slows it down, and sometimes stops it completely. Wow, yeah. I mean, I really... You know, in, in therapy, we obviously we try to work on improving people's health and getting them more physically active and whatnot. And we definitely have the the smoking talk with uh, with all of them. And, and before they go to surgery, we really emphasize it as much as possible because we do uh, we do see it. We see it on our end, you know, when we're trying to work with these folks and we're trying to get them uh, fit, which is going to lead us into our next question. 
Um, can we talk a little bit about the microvasculature around the spine? Does it um, diminish over time? And uh, because I'm a huge advocate of cardiovascular exercise, core stabilization, proper body mechanics after surgery, um, we get almost all of your spine patients and any other surgical spine patient on a tre on a treadmill, on a bike, upper body bike, elliptical trainer, anything that keeps the spine in a relatively neutral position, but increases their cardiovascular um, output. Uh, I find they do much better with that. But on a mic microvasculature level, do you can you fill us in on on is there less circulation to the spine as you get older? Uh, there is, and, and there's certainly conditions. We just touched on one, smoking, and uh, things like diabetes that affect microvasculature. Uh, we talked earlier about how the disc, uh, the disc space, the um, cartilaginous material uh, between the vertebral bodies doesn't have direct input from blood vessels. It kind of leaches off the microvasculature that supplies the end plates of the bones above and below. So you really want to maximize perfusion, particularly if you're trying to get that disc, that annulus, that that ring around the disc to heal, you want to optimize, maximize uh, uh, blood flow in the microvasculature. Just as nicotine causes vasoconstriction and uh, narrows down those blood vessels and impairs the delivery of oxygen, um, uh, age, uh, diabetes, and uh, in other cardiovascular uh, troubles uh, can, uh, can impair healing and can also contribute to wear and tear on the spine. So I agree with you, Paul. I think that uh, cardiovascular health, overall health, uh, uh, very important for the spine in particular. All right, great, thanks. Um, I have a tough one for you here, and, and, and maybe you can't answer this question. Uh, I, I don't know, but uh, give it a shot if you can. If, a, if you're in doing surgery, and somebody has a pretty severe, you know, canal stenosis, uh, a foraminal stenosis, the nerve root is being pinched off really hard. You're going in there, you're decompressing that, you're removing that disc material away from that nerve root. And uh, maybe you're doing a little foraminotomy, you're opening that up. When you look at that nerve root, can you somewhat predict how badly it's damaged and what kind of outcome they will have afterwards? I mean, can you, can you come out of surgery and say, boy, that was really looking bad. And, and I think this is going to be a real tough recovery, or maybe you're not going to be able to recover because of what I saw there. I mean, is it, does it work that way? Uh, the short answer is doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, uh, we do use a microscope when we operate so we can see things real big, you know, tiny things are made big and we can, we can see structure, uh, but we can't see nerve cells. We can't see, you know, what's happening with those axons, those little microfilaments that, that, uh, uh, that, that conduct nerve impulses. We can't see that. Oftentimes when we decompress, we see nerves that are just totally crimped and uh, uh, squeezed in a permanent way, uh, kinked off like a hose. And you would think that that would predict a bad outcome, uh, but that's not, not necessarily the case. Uh, sometimes when I've seen some, some, some pretty nasty looking nerves, people do just fine. And similarly, when nerves look pretty darn good, nice and full and well perfused. Sometimes those nerves just don't recover. And unfortunately, we cannot see things on the cellular level. We, we, we just can't assess the health of that nerve just by looking at it. So uh, uh, deformity uh, uh, or uh, obvious damage that we can see with a microscope doesn't necessarily predict a bad outcome. Uh, short answer is no. We, we can't tell. We can't predict the future just by just by looking during surgery. Sure, sure. Um, how much weight do you put in uh, in a straight leg raise test when you see a patient in the office? Well, straight leg raise test is is very sensitive. Uh, in some studies, a straight leg raise test, when you have the patient you know, laying on their back and you lift that limb on the same side of, uh, of the pain, it, the sensitivity is like 90 some percent, but the specificity is only like 35%. It means it's really, really sensitive. Something's creating this pain, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a disc herniation. Uh, not to get too geeky, but the uh, crossed straight leg raise test, uh, it is not nearly as sensitive, but it's much more specific for a disc herniation. Got to tell you, I rarely use the crossed leg, you know, cr cross straight leg raise test, but um, um, I, I will say that the straight leg raise test is is certainly a way to bring out the patient's radiculopathy, uh, maybe to help analyze the distribution of the pain. Um, but in and of itself, it is not specific for disc herniation. There's other things that can create that same phenomenon. Yeah. Okay, great. 
um, L1 through S1, what is the um, what is the level that probably will give the person most disability? 90% of our business is at L45 and L5S1. So the L5 and S1 nerve roots, maybe the L4, L5 and S1 nerve roots, those are the ones that are are, are, are most often on the on the chopping block. And the reason is because that's the most active area of the spine. That's where you've got it, you know, the, 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 there's the most motion uh, toward, toward, towards the bottom of the spine. Um, your your lumbar spine is 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 fading into the sacrum there. And they biomechanically, uh, that that's where most of the stresses occur. So L four five and L five S one, that's where we look first. Okay, great. Um, let me ask you a little bit about neurogenic claudication. People say, you know, I'm walking and legs just start to feel numb. They're getting heavy, um, and I'm getting pain down my legs. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what's happening there when people are are giving us these symptoms. So I, I would start, I think, by contrasting neurogenic claudication, which means, uh, if, you, if you translate, it means I can't walk because of a nerve reason. Uh, if we contrast that with sciatica or radiculopathy, uh, the, the latter, sciatica or radiculopathy, tends to occur due to disc herniation or isolated compression of a single nerve root. And uh, these patients, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's not subtle. You know, they they have pain going down a leg all the time because that nerve is is just getting constitutively squeezed. Neurogenic claudication is a little bit different because of the biomechanics of the spinal canal. When people sit, their canal opens and uh, they have a little bit more wiggle room for those nerves. When they stand, they go into extension, and that pinches off the canal and pinches off the nerves inside. And for reasons that we don't fully understand, whether there's not enough arterial supply, if there's venous engorgement, we can't get rid of some of the waste products that the nerves generate, or just uh, compression of the nerves themselves, the legs start to feel heavy and tired. And oh my gosh, these people, they have to sit down. And as soon as they sit down and open the canal again, their symptoms go away. So that, that phenomenon of neurogenic claudication is due to different diameters of the spinal canal, depending on whether the patient is sitting or standing. One more thing I would add, oftentimes when people are walking, people that have this spinal stenosis, it creates neurogenic claudication. They will lean forward on the shopping cart. They love that. If they lean forward on the shopping cart, they can go forever. Uh, sometimes people can bicycle on a stationary bicycle forever, but ask them to walk around the high school track, they can't do it because the, the attitude of the spine is, is different there. Uh, that's neurogenic claudication, very, very common as we age due to progressive degenerative stenosis or tightening of that spinal canal. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I find that um, there is a significant number of patients who have severe degenerative hip disease and spinal stenosis. There, there is a definite correlation between the two, and I'm going to somehow get somebody to do a study for me someday to confirm that uh, because one really contributes to the other, and uh, I, I think if we can manage one, uh, we can certainly help manage the other. Uh, and Paul, I just want, let me just inter interject. I, I read this uh, cool study the other day. If you have a hip problem, and you have a lumbar spine problem, which one should you treat first? And the answer is the hip. And the reason is because people can develop kind of a, like almost a flexion contracture almost due to the hip pathology. And once the hip is relieved after it's replaced or, 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 or operated upon, the back can assume a more normal position and the symptoms sometimes go away. So I, I found that interesting because oftentimes with this hip spine disease, which is a real thing. Absolutely. You people that have you know, both problems, where do we start? And I think most of the time, uh, the, the answer may be, let's start with the hips. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing at how many times I see this. And it's really a no fault to anybody. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see patients who have had uh, injections of the spine, x-rays, MRIs, a full course of therapy, some chiropractic treatment, the whole shoot and match, you know, for two or three years, probably spent $30,000 in diagnostic tests and, and treatment um, just to find out that they have an arthritic hip and they have a hip replacement and boom, they're better. Uh, right. And I see that so often. Uh, and, and we really kind of, in therapy, we treat both of them 
very similarly, we try to get the hip into better extension. We try to get the uh, lumbar spine in less of a lordotic curve, and uh, we try to reduce that. So I've, I've dubbed it the uh, anti-spinal stenosis program, and um, there's a whole series of exercises that we've developed specific for those patients. They fail that, then they go to interventional uh, pain, and then uh, over to you guys. While we're at it, uh, what are your thoughts about interventional injections of the uh, spine for for especially like a, a radiculopathy, somebody who's getting some nerve root compression. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think that uh, depending on what the, the reason is for neural compression, uh, injections definitely play a role. And the idea there is you know, certainly injecting steroid and numbing medicine is not going to change the anatomy. It's not going to dissolve the disc herniation, but it's going to buy you time. And you know, up to 90% of people that have an injection will get some response. And oftentimes that response can last several months. And if we can temporize things, the patient gets an injection, cools down their leg pain, they can live their life, then we can let mother nature take care of breaking down that disc herniation, that disc, as we talked about at the beginning of our discussion, that disc can and will resorb. So an injection is often done to buy time. Where it's a little bit more controversial and perhaps not as effective is with spinal stenosis, with things like neurogenic claudication, where you have that tight canal that's not going to get untight spontaneously. It's not going to resorb like a disc herniation will. Although injections play a role there, it is a very temporary one. And studies have shown that although it provides temporary benefit, it doesn't really stop people from uh, 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 going to surgery, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't uh, it take people off the off the surgical roster. So it's a uh, it's a way to make the family reunion. It's a way to maybe get through that uh, hiking trip through Europe, but it is not going to last. And and these people come back uh, like a bad penny. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think that uh, the injections do a great job at, at decreasing chemical irritation, you know, because there's both Absolutely. chemical and mechanical irritation. And it does a really good job with with that that chemical irritation. Um, but I, what, what, as a therapist, what I always ask the patient is, you know, what level did you get it at? And if I can't get it from the patient, I get this information. I say, where did you have this injection? And if they say, yeah, I had this injection in my back and I feel, you know, 10 times better, um, it's very diagnostic to that. Um, and, um, I find it to be helpful for that, but if they're, you know, having a mechanical compression, they may get some temporary relief. Um, but like you said, I think in the long run, uh, it's, it's a matter of, can we just, you know, decompress them mechanically, uh, through exercise or do they have to have it done uh, neurosurgically? Right. Right. Yep. I think we agree. Uh, injections are, are a great, great short-term solution and they can be very helpful, uh, diagnostically as well. Yeah, great. Well, that's going to conclude our show. Dr. Wallach, is there anything that you'd like to add to uh, or any information you'd like to give out there about uh, neurosurgery and uh, lumbar spine issues? I would say that uh, even though I'm a surgeon, uh, I, I think it's important to know that um, the vast majority of, uh, of lumbar spine disease or, or problems will get better on their own. And uh, our philosophy uh, is that surgery is really a uh, maybe not the last resort, but um, we 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 offer people surgery on a on a very limited basis. And I think that what you're doing, uh, physical therapy, uh, you know, exercise based uh, uh, approaches to 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 this type of thing, are so much more preferable and and incredibly effective. So I would say that if somebody is suffering from uh, lumbar spine pathology from low back pain from leg pain they want to start maybe with their local physical therapist because Paul you've been a great not only a, a, a therapeutically helping these folks but also helping to diagnose what their problem is is it their hip is it their back so I, I guess my little piece of advice would be you got a back problem you got some leg pain start locally start with your physical therapist and and see if they can point you in the right direction because that's what we're going to tell you anyway if you drive drive on down and see us we're going to start with the basics Right, right. Well, excellent. Dr. Wallach, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, My pleasure. 
the you're you're always a, a pleasure to talk to and uh it's uh a lot of the folks today listening to this don't actually hear about how witty you are but this is the wittiest guy i've ever uh talked to in my life um just as sharp as attack and uh, always uh, always very willing to help us out because obviously we don't have the answers to everything and um you know it, it's great to collaborate and communicate and do things the right way and i really think that um you know if you haven't connected with a a neurosurgeon that you're comfortable with and and uh, you need to do that you need to sit down with somebody and say can i bounce some things off of you uh, and and whatnot uh, you know and and dr wallach i'm sure you're the first you, you'll be the first to admit that you you can't see all these patients yourself you have great nps and and great pas who help to triage your patients and really take a load off of you but but collaborate with you also yeah, they, they are excellent. Um, uh, you know, every every patient that comes down, you know, eventually does see uh, a surgeon, one of us. But uh, but boy, those the PAs that we work with are outstanding, and uh, boy, I learned I learned so much from them. Just kind of uh, you know watching how they how they examine the patient, how they come up with these diagnoses. We got a great team. We've got a great team down there. Excellent. So, um, folks, I want to make sure that you uh, stay tuned to some future podcasts. We're going to be talking about how to manage chronic low back pain. And that is a beast in itself that, you know, um, that is not just about exercise. That's not just about injections. That's not just about surgery. And sometimes you do any of those three or all three of them, and you can open up a can of worms. So we're going to talk about how to identify chronic back pain, what else comes with it, uh, and talk about that full package and how to manage them. We're going to be talking about body mechanics. We're be talking about workplace injuries um, with a specialist uh, who will uh, be coming on to the show. So please stay tuned. We're going to have some great content, great shows coming up. Make sure that you visit orthoevalpal.com and uh, leave us a rating, a review. Go to uh, iTunes and uh, give us a thumbs up. And uh, if you have any questions or would like to hear about a particular topic on our podcast show, um, shoot it out at me and uh, I'll put something together for you. So uh, make sure also that you subscribe to our YouTube channel because recently I put on some really nice uh, videos about how to evaluate the lumbar spine from L1 through S, uh, S1. Um, I talked to you about doing a complete lower quadrant screening, talked a little bit about cauda equina, and uh, all of those little tidbits of information that we're not just reading off of a cue card, but putting some actual experience to. So make sure you get over to YouTube, uh, check us out there, and uh, give us a thumbs up. And uh, again, thank you so much um, for being with us. I am your host, Paul Marquis, and happy evaluating.